So welcome back to Senate Education. We have the chair of the State Board of Education, Jennifer Samuelson, uh, up from Manchester, Vermont. Not actually, not Man Are you tech? What town are you? Windhall. You're in Windhall. Uh, to talk with us about the State Board of Education, and Jennifer, I don't know if you've been in this room because the last couple of years was entirely over Zoom. That is correct. Yeah. This is my first time in my capacity as. The it's on the a, state board. On the state board. Oh, yeah. 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 So thank you. And you guys got me in person because I testified twice before House Ed um, over Zoom. Yeah. So. You made the right choice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, so we have the Secretary of State coming in at 315. Okay. Does that work for you? Sure. Great. Um, so uh, I will go through as much as I can. Um, sure. And then I think. If there are questions, maybe what would be helpful is just, you know, we can have more of a conversation. And if you need me to come back, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. So, yeah. In fact, why don't we see, can you ask the Secretary of Education, or Secretary of State, if you can reach them, just to give us, uh, as could give us maybe five extra minutes? Yeah. yeah, so maybe come at 320 or 325? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, please. Right. So, I think if you guys have the um, presentation up, um, I'm going to blow past the first page because we all know that. Um, so I wanted to just really give an overview about the State Board of Education um, for those of you who might not be aware of you know, how we came to be where we are. Um, so we are essentially a volunteer board um, comprised of um, 10 members, um, the 10th being the Secretary of Education, um, and we have two student members. Uh, who typically serve two years, so the first year they're non-voting and then the second year they are voting and then they graduate off. Um, so I included on the second slide just an overview of all of our current members, where they're from, as well as when their terms expire. But um, I think the thing that's important with this slide is that um, we run the gamut of, you know, I'm a lawyer, um, I don't necessarily have an education background. Um, I've sort of taught here and there, but um, we have former principals, heads of school, substitute teachers, teachers, um, you know, certainly the students, um, regional business people, um, and I think the one thing that we all share in common is this, you know, commitment to education. Um, so we really bring a wide variety of perspectives and backgrounds to our conversations, which I think is really helpful. Um, the next slide. Um, I thought it would be helpful because in a way that, you know, frankly, I'm still trying to keep straight in my head, the relationship between the Agency of Education and the State Board of Education. Because and if I could just give some context here, if you don't mind, for one sure. second. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, just a reminder, Secretary French mentioned this years ago, uh, the agent, it was the State Board that hired and fired the then Commissioner of Education. And that commissioner reported directly to the State Board of Education, and it was under Representative Donovan's leadership mm -hmm. in the House during, uh, and others that really felt as though, okay, we've got to move away from this. This person needs a seat at the table. If you're running to be governor of the state, you have to answer education questions, and that's why we now have all of you more involved with just vetting who the candidates are. In the end, the governor chooses his or her choice to be Secretary of Education. Yeah. And less, and there's less reporting to all of you. Correct, and so the board of the governor. Yeah, I mean it's more of a consultation. Um, okay, it, it's not. We do not have oversight. So, I, I think you said it far more eloquently than I did. <laughs> um, but slide three kind of goes through that historic relationship with the um, agency and the state board, and it was really in 2012 that that switch that um, Senator Campion just mentioned. Um, occurred, where prior to that we were really a board overseeing a commissioner who um, worked for the Department of Education um, and supervised the commissioner's activities. In 2012, which is the next slide, um, it was Act 98, established the Agency of Education, elevated the commissioner to now a cabinet level secretary, and we no longer oversee the agency's policies, programs, or resources, but we still retain oversight with respect to the rulemaking process, um, which I will sort of circle back to at the end of the presentation because, you know, all except for the district quality standards, which are currently being written, um, currently the State Board of Ed owns the rules. Um, and I 
you know, my guess is that that will probably change, but as it is now, there's still our rules, even though a lot of the work when you get into it is really more agency work. Um, so then next slide is the unique position of the state board, and this is really what we offer. Um, as I mentioned before, we're essentially volunteers. Um, we are independent, so you know we, we haven't been hired really, I mean, we've been selected by the governor, but you know we're not hired to perform a certain function. Um, we are a neutral body, and so our primary goal is to act within the constraints of legislative intent and always sort of determining what that intent is and making sure that we you know, stay in our lane. Um, we advise the General Assembly when asked, such as you know, moments like today, um, we provide a public meeting space, and I think this is really, really important, and maybe one of the things that the State Board does best is that we have this open space, every meeting is open to the public, we begin every meeting with public comment, we end every meeting with public comment, you know, it, we really try to be this place for people to come, you know, whether they're parents or teachers, um, to talk about whatever it is that, you know, they feel is relevant, you know, with regard to education. Um, and we're an instrumentality of the General Assembly. So again, that goes back to, you know, we're here kind of at the behest of um, the legislature. Um, and so for instance, um, Act 46 of 2015, uh, the State Board of Ed implemented the legislature's vision for consolidation of school governance as a means of improving equity, excellence, and efficiency in the state's pre-K to 12 education system. So that was something that the legislature had identified as a priority we were then given the work of figuring out how to implement Act 46. Um, Senator Hashim. Uh, quick question, and this is just sure. my own experience because I'm new to this sector of government, but members of this board, are they all appointed by the governor, or where yes. do they come from? Okay. Except for, well, I'm the secretary, oh. um, because he is, um, he's a non-voting member of the board, okay. but everyone else is appointed by the governor. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the next slide is current State Board of Ed activities. As I mentioned before, we're, you know, we're a public forum, so we often um, have regular diversity, equity, and inclusion presentations where we have people from around the state who come and talk about the good work that we're doing. Um, we also invited you know, schools or supervisory unions in to our meetings to talk about the work that they're doing or challenges that they've faced and how they've handled it. So, you know, again, I'm really, trying to sort of honor the space where we have um, this opportunity to be a good exchange of ideas. Um, and then how do those ideas advance? That is a good question. Um, at, at this point, I don't know. I mean, it's really, I, I think we have good turnout, particularly since we've gone mostly online with um, people from the public tuning into our meetings. Um, so I would hope, um, but that's a really good point, that other members of the public would hear something or see something on the agenda and say, wow, that, I'd really like to do that. Um, or you could bring it to us or Secretary French. Exactly. It rises to the top. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, we also serve in a quasi-judicial role. Um, there are specific rules and um, statutes that provide us with this judicial authority. So for instance, we handle rate appeals, tuition appeals, um, those are two of the things that we've done in the last couple of years. Um, so we sometimes will hire um, someone to serve as legal counsel as a, as a hearing officer. Um, sometimes we don't really, depending on the, the matter at hand. Um, yes. Sorry, um, just to understand the difference between rate appeals and tuition appeals. I understand the tuition appeals. But what about a rate appeal? Would that be the rate like a, a tech center sets to charge its students? It could be the rate appeal that you know I was thinking of, I believe it was a therapeutic independent school where they were negotiating with the agency for the rate that they were charging for a particular time period. Um, there was a disagreement, and so it came to the State Board of Ed where we took testimony. Um, deliberated and reached a decision. And we did have the assistance of a hearing officer with that. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions before I go on? Um, we also 
handled withdrawals from supervisory union supervisory districts. Um, and this is another example of you know, a good working relationship with the General Assembly where there wasn't a good roadmap for withdrawals. And last year- From Act 46 or just in general? <laughs> mostly from Act 46, I think, and it, it, it depends on if it, you're a union elementary school, a union high school, a unified union <laughs> high school, if you were forced merged pursuant to Act 46, if you voluntarily more merged pursuant to Act 46, and basically depending on what your status was and the circumstances under which you merged, the law had different outcomes, which really seemed unfair. So last year, the General Assembly came together and took a lot of time, I think, to craft some legislation to really create a more unified process so that it doesn't matter how you came to be merged. Um, there's now you know, clear law that's in the books that would allow towns who are interested in withdrawing um, to go through this process. Um, so that was good working with the General Assembly. And then based on this new law, we were able to work with different school districts, some of whom chose to go back to their supervisory unions, some didn't, um, you know, really depending on the school district. Um, we also have oversight over independent school approvals, um, which is, you know, we're sort of the final step in a very, you know, thoughtful, multi-month long process um, before we get to the State Board of Ed approving or not um, an independent school. And then as I mentioned, we also um, oversee rulemaking. So in 2022, we um, did updates to the Rule 2200 series, which governs um, independent schools. And we also, um, this was a much smaller um, amount of work, but we did updates to the Rule 7000 series, um, which was largely non-substantive, but for we basically lifted accrediting agencies that were listed in the 7000 series and put them into the 2200 series. Um, and currently, we're looking at updates to the education quality standards, which are um, the Rule 2000 series. Just pause there for a moment. Would you mind telling us the difference between an approved independent school and a, is it recognized independent school? Yes. So, okay. well, and I'll start at the very bottom. Okay. <laughs> so, kind of at the bottom, you have homeschool. Yeah. Um, okay. In terms of oversight by any regulatory authority. So homeschool, I mean, I know that um, you know, parents have to have a curriculum, but there's, it's kind of the, the lowest rung in terms of oversight. The next level is a recognized independent school where you might have a building, I, mean, I think you probably have to have a building. Um, you are more than a homeschool, you have multiple students from different families, um, but you're recognized. The next phase is- And there's is some oversight there. Not a whole lot. It, it, okay. I think it's more of like a filing and you know we are aware that a recognized school exists, but we don't have much oversight authority over a recognized school. Um, the next level would be an approved independent school and effective July 1st, 2023, that label is going to bifurcate. And so you're gonna have approved independent schools that are ineligible to receive public funds, and then you will have approved independent schools, which by definition are approved to receive public funds. So the carve out now is to be an approved independent school, but not eligible to receive public funds. And the distinguishing characteristic there is um, pursuant to Act 173, um, there are now special ed requirements that an approved independent school would have to comply with in order to continue to receive um, public tuition dollars. The other parts of Act 170, well, it was not related to Act 173, but there were updates to the 2200 series have to do with discrimination. Um, we spent a lot of time as a subcommittee making updates to the um, 2200 rules to make it clear that any approved independent school must comply with our anti-discrimination um, laws that are already on the books. And those laws went into effect last May. Um, that went through the LCAR process and those portions of the updates to 2200 became effective 15 days after we met with LCAR. 
And just some, again, a little historical background. Our committee took that up last year also after hearing from our ledge council. And there was some disagreement around it from attorneys as to whether or not it would be more, our attorney recommended it be more powerful if we put something in statute. And that's why this committee in part passed out S219. <clears throat> right, so it is in rule. But yeah, it's, which is great, yeah. which is a big help. Thank you. Um, and then just scooting on to the next slide, which is slide seven. Um, the authority to engage in rulemaking derives from 16 BSA section 164.7, um, which gives us the authority to carry out the powers and duties of the board as directed by the General Assembly within the limitations of legislative intent. So I always, you know, when I'm looking at work that the state board is doing, I'm always sort of looking at it through that lens. And so as long as the work we're doing falls within that lens, you know, we are acting within the scope of our authority. If it's outside of that, then, you know, I would say that we're not acting within the scope of our authority. Um, the next slide um, is a, an overview of state board event rulemaking. Um, so in this, I pulled from, I put the website at the bottom. Um, but basically, you know, again, saying that, you know, we have the authority to create rules. And once a rule series is open, we follow the um, Administrative Procedure Act formal rulemaking process. Um, so I don't know how interested you are in going through the rulemaking process, or if there are other things that I can answer. Um, certainly, the next few slides sort of talk about, from start to finish, you know, A to Z, what it looks like. Um, for the State Board of Ed to update the rule series. And um, I'm happy to go into detail, but basically the formal APA rulemaking process is an eight month period from the time a proposed rule is filed with the Secretary of State. And we go before ICAR, which is the Interagency Commission on Administrative Rules. Uh, we have eight months from that time that the proposed rules are filed with the Secretary of State to go through the public comment period, make any revisions necessary, and appear before LCAR. What the State Board has done, at least since I've been on the board, and I know beforehand as well, is we actually go through a pretty robust pre-filing process. So right now, like we're working on the rules governing education quality standards. Those rules are not officially open, but we've had, um, I mean, it started with the Act One advisory group, um, they, they did a whole bunch of work on the rules. And I'm then sure I reminded everyone Act 1, which is the yeah, ethnic studies. It just, it yes, thank you. Out. Yeah, no, some, some yeah. Results. Um, so the Act 1 advisory group um, sort of took the first bite at the rules. Um, then this, though that version of the rules came before the State Board of Education, I believe it was last spring. And at that point, mm -hmm. we began, we stood up um, a subcommittee and that subcommittee has been working since last spring to do its work before we even get to the formal APA rulemaking process. So they've already had a series of meetings that are open to the public. They've invited stakeholders in to talk about updates to the rules. Um, they had a public hearing where they took testimony from anyone who you know, wanted to call in. Um, so that by the time we get to the formal APA rulemaking process, we've already done a pretty deep dive on the rules. Um, so slide 10, slide 11 really goes through that process and then I included in the next few slides a case study which basically just goes through and summarizes the updates to the Rule Series 2200. Um, so I'm happy to go into more detail on that. Why don't you go through the case study? That might be sure. helpful. Okay. So this is slide 12. Um, this began with the General Assembly's passage of Act 173 of 2018. Um, and again, there was an advisory group that was created in the language of Act 173 itself with, um, I think it was a 14 member committee. And the language of the act stated, you know, each of the organizations that would have a seat at the table in this advisory group. Um, the act also directed the Agency of Education to make recommendations to the State Board of Ed for you know, the State Board's consideration. And it also provided the State Board of Ed with the direction necessary for it to develop amendments to its rules, uh, particularly Rule 2200 series, governing the approval of independent schools. Um, so 
slide 13, the advisory group convened its first meeting September 14th, 2019. I think by the terms of the act, they had roughly eight meetings per year. Um, and then of course COVID happened, so it kind of <laughs> threw the timeline out a little bit for everybody. Um, but it came to the state board December of 2020, and then the 2200 subcommittee was formed by the state board of ed to sort of pick up the work from the advisory group. Um, the state board had its first meeting on January 8th, 2021, and met 10 times during the pre-filing process. So this is even before the rules are officially open. Um, to identify rules that can be updated independent of Act 173. So the important thing is, is once a rule series is open, we can, I mean, we can open a rule series if we want, but if a rule series is open, we have the ability to update any rule within that rule series still consistent with legislative intent. And so as a state board, we looked at it and said, you know, what rules could we update and sort of hitch them on to the Act 173 timeline and make some improvements to our rules because they're open and you know why not take advantage of this. Um, so some of the things that the subcommittee recommended was adding ASNI, which is the Association of Independent Schools in New England, as a recognized accrediting agency. This was in addition to NEASC, um, which everyone might be more familiar with. I'm sorry if you already covered this, but uh, when a rule series is open, what, how does that happen? What opens a rule series? So for this case, then this was a good question. It was opened by virtue of Act 173. Okay. So the legislature directed us to update our rules consistent with Act 173. Okay. Um, I think on our own initiative, the board could look at a rule series and say, you know, it's probably time to update it. We're going to open it. Okay. Um, so really, you know, two different ways. Got it. So it's open either through legislation or you folks decide. That it's open. Yeah, and usually if it's open by legislation, we're given a deadline by which um, we would have to commence the APA rulemaking process. Thank you. Um, anyone else? <laughs> um, so the first thing we did is we added ASNI. Um, the benefit with ASNI is um, they offer a similar accreditation as NEASC, but work more with K-8 schools, and their price point is based on the size of the school. So for smaller schools, it seemed to be a more affordable option to have this third-party accreditation, which we felt was really important. Um, another thing is we added a requirement that any independent school that boards students must either be accredited by a state or regional agency, such as NEASC or ASME, or um, licensed by the Department of Children and Families as a residential child care facility. So just adding a little bit more oversight um, to any school that is boarding a student. Um, and then we have a Sure. Are, are public schools also accredited by DS? No. Not at the moment. No. I okay. do believe that public schools, I know they can. I, I know their website, I remember over the summer, it's, it, it had some section on public schools. But okay. Yes, Senator Blue, if you agree with anyway. If you don't mind. No, please. I, at, um, uh, the schools I've worked in at Vermont were accredited by NEASC. Okay. It was every 10 years. We'd have to go through this fairly okay. intense process. So there may be some. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. And I know public schools, the agency makes visits, I believe, every three years. Okay. Um, NEASC accreditation, according to the 2200 rules, an independent school can be accredited by NEASC for longer than five years, but the state board requires a review at least every five years. Um, and for initial approvals, the initial approval is only for a period of two years. So again, just trying to have some oversight um, on that process. Um, and then the final thing that we decided to do while the rule series was open was to update the procedure for enrolling publicly funded students in approved independent schools. Um, so I'll go to the next slide. And this is just going through the timeline. So um, we voted to, you know, we had the 10 pre-filing meetings as a subcommittee. Then we brought, you know, our proposed changes before the full state board in May of 2021. Um, then we initiated the, the formal APA rulemaking process. Um, we don't have to have any public comment hearings by statute, um, we felt it was important to have them. And in fact, we scheduled four. 
that we tried to offer at different times of day, different days of the week, you know, really trying to capture public comment and really get, it was very important for us to have um, feedback from members of the public as well as significant input from stakeholders because this was, you know, we wanted really to come up with something that we thought was meeting the needs um, as articulated by you know, the General Assembly, but also in keeping with our rules. Yes? Just to get a sense of um, public engagement, what kind of uh, public comment do you get? Do you have like you know, do 10, 20 people show up for public comment, or just well, a few? Well, it was funny, that, and that's a good question. So um, you know, we had a bunch of stakeholder input when we were drafting the rules, because again, our meetings are open to the public, and we would invite you know, people to come. Um, with these four public comment hearings, I think maybe in the first three we might have had two people, <laughs> which was like, okay. Um, I think the fourth one we might have had a couple, and then the interesting thing is, is we received a lot of written comment literally in the last three days of the public comment period before it closed. Um, and that's really where the work began. <laughs> so, you know, as much as I was trying to sort of you know, give every opportunity and, you know, really have a nice, you know, amount of time to go through the work, it was really like in the last three days that things, and it was mostly written comment. And I think, if I'm remembering, it was probably 11 people who between them had somewhere in the 80s, like 80 something comments that as a the subcommittee had to address. And so, you know, we were assisted in this by the Agency of Education, and um, Emily Simmons had just a you know, fantastic spreadsheet. But we went through and had to accept or deny and explain if we were denying every public comment. So again, it was a very you know, comprehensive process. Um, so, but I mean, I would say that it all paid off because um, the rules were unanimously approved at LCAR um, last April. So, the next slide, slide 15, um, really breaks down the non-Act 173 related rules, which again, you know, we just took advantage of the fact that the rules were open. Those changes that are not related to Act 173 became effective last May. So that includes Rule 2223, which is procedure, including um, revocation or suspension of approval. We also updated um, the complaint process and crafted a new probation status. Um, so we really kind of built in more language for that. Um, Rule 22-24 also went into effect last May, and that was the one that added ASNI. Um, Rule 22-26 is the application, and Rule 22-27 is sort of like the mirror approval by the state board. Um, but that's really where we put in the language of non-discrimination. Um, that is consistent with Vermont Public Accommodations Act as well as the Vermont Fair Employment Practices Act. Um, and then also we added in a 2227 um, this accreditation requirement for schools that board. Um, the Act 173 related rules, and those are all of the changes that, up, that, that pertain to special ed, those go into effect this July. And so at that point, we're going to have this bifurcation with approved independent schools. Depending so on all this work has been done, it's interesting. I believe the AO, or the, was it the NEA that was in saying that they want Act 173 appealed? Okay. Re appealed or repealed? Repealed, I'm sorry. So, yeah, I mean, the, these, these rules are on the books. <laughs> right, right, um, right. And so much of it was special education work. It was during when Senator uh, Booth was the chair of the committee, I remember. And yeah, I don't, I don't quite follow their logic. What do you mean by board uh, students? Um, so is that under approval? Yeah, um, I would require referring to independent school oh, board students. So like this would be a student that would be staying in a dorm um, or in a facility that um, houses students, like so they're sleeping there overnight. I was just remembering the testimony um, by the, was it the Vermont Principals Association. There was only one, um, I think it was um, Jeff who was here, was only talking about amending one part of Acts 173. Oh, it wasn't, wasn't a it? repeal. I thought I'm I saw that remember. priorities a repeal. What was it? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's going to bug me now. Sorry. Are there any conflicts between you and the Agency of Education 
in terms of, you know, here you are, you're two separate bodies still, you, you both have you know, different rules and responsibilities. Anything there, that any kinks that we would need to work out legislatively so that it's more smooth? So, yeah, um, I mean, I, I think we have a very good working relationship yes, with the agency definitely. for sure. Yes. Um, and, you know, they, they have been wonderful in terms of providing us with administrative assistance, um, you know, helping schedule meetings, doing minutes for our full monthly um, board meetings, which are voluminous. Um, I think where it gets a little bit tricky is we're still kind of running into each other because even though Act 98, which you know created this secretary level position mm -hmm. who no longer re reports to the board, if you look at the rules, a lot of the rules still have this language of you know commissioner and you know the secretary does not report to the board. And so, you know, some of these rules are kind of in this no man's land because, and I think I have one of the slides, maybe it's the last slide. Um, you know, I, I could look at the rule series 1100. It was last revised in 1992, um, arguably it needs to be updated. Um, and then the next category are rules that, you know, they still belong to us, but the substance of them is really more aligned with what the agency does. Um, so, for instance, setting the length of a school day and year, driver education courses, school building sites, construction, um, all of those rules I think are probably more appropriately um, placed with the agency. Mm -hmm. So I think the big challenge for us is um, we really need to figure out this final division of roles and responsibilities between the two organizations. And I think we work well together and I think that we offer things that the agency doesn't and vice versa. Yeah. Um, and then. Importantly, that what goes along with that is um, more and more a lot of the work that we're doing does require um, legal knowledge, legal counsel, um, and I think it would be helpful for us to have our own dedicated legal counsel to, help, to assist us in the work. So I can't agree more with that. I think it's, it's a lot to have Emily Simmons doing both the work for AOE and for you. The other concern and problem I have in addition to any possible conflict is that you all do, I recognize how much work you all do, and you really don't get anything for it ex except some reimbursements and, yeah. so I, that's, you don't know, comment on that. But, <laughs> I'm happy to come back and talk about yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, but that is certainly a concern as well. Yeah, yeah. so I think it, I mean, one of the goals that I have, um, and again, you know, because we're volunteer and we all have jobs apart from this, um, is to reconstitute that roles and responsibilities subcommittee. I think as a practical matter, we need to get the education quality standard rules put into the APA rulemaking process, and then that will give us a little bit of time to brief where we can reconstitute that subcommittee. And I'd really, you know, in an ideal world, I would love to have this um, buttoned up, this legislative session, maybe next nice one. But I think it's important for us to be able to do our work and then really attend to updating the rules um, would be helpful. Who is your predecessor? Um, Oliver Olson. Prior to Oliver. John Carroll. John. He also, they came up with a document, and that was something that I think was dropped a few years ago that I want to return to. Looking at, again, those roles and responsibilities of each and kind of working to divide them up. Okay. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Oh, thank you. <laughs> really, really helpful. Well, and I'm, I'm happy we to We usually back. give a grade, uh, I'd say, I'd say <laughs> A minus 10 A. She's a constituent of mine. I mean, what are you doing? You get a B plus? Uh, <laughs> no, that was really helpful. It was a great overview. Great, and feel free to follow up if you have any questions. Yeah. And I think we'll have you back in or by Zoom if you want to. At some point, we're going to have to pull apart more of the independent school stuff. You know, it sounds like I'd be curious more what that middle group is in particular that might not have any oversight and whether or not we should be sending that some of that work to you to help us to give them a little oversight. Sure. So, great. All right. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thanks very much. Yeah. And feel free to stick around. Yeah. I mean, or. or I would love to take you up on that. I actually yeah. have another meeting. Okay. All right. <laughs> Madam Secretary, well, hello. hello, please join us. And so, do you have a guest that you would like to have uh, also join you? Um, I have my chief of staff, Brian Mills, who's going to hang with me and, Terrific. you know, 
take notes. And thank thank you. Jennifer, great to see you. Uh, okay. But you know, now that I hear that it being graded, I'm really glad yeah, that I brought you some swag because uh, you know I want to make sure okay. they uh, please take one and pass them. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what I'm giving oh, you. Uh, there's one for your committee assistant as well, and uh, and and an extra one in general um, in case. In case you have a favorite committee friend who wants one. Um, one of the uh, one of the roles of the Secretary of State's office has always can you hand that to your committee assistant? Um, has been to provide uh, pocket constitutions so that if you ever wonder about um, the uh, something that you're contemplating, you can refer back to the constitution. Um, Thank you. Newly updated, fresh with the new amendments that we just voted on this past November. Very cool. Great. Yes. So, so, civic education has been something that has popped up in this committee for the past several years. Mm -hmm. And we have, over the past couple of years, and I think it will probably happen this year as well, somebody always puts a bill in that says something along the lines of either it's requiring a class or requiring mm -hmm. students to, upon, you know, in order to graduate, pass the citizen, US citizens test or something like that. And civic education, we're also expecting a report, and if you would remind me to email Agency of Education, to, last year we asked them to kind of give us what was happening out there. And there's no question that there are a lot of interesting things happening at a lot of different schools. And I'm sure, this I have no evidence, but I'm sure in some areas it might not be as vibrant as in, in other institutions. But civic education also, it's one of those things I think we all recognize it doesn't end in high school. Uh, it doesn't begin in high school. And one of the most interesting uh, witnesses we have la had last year was Mara Levinson from Harvard Ed, who said to us, it's, it's John Dewey, get people to do it. Get people to do civic education like they do other things, whether it's biology or math. And that means getting people like our committee assistant in a room like this as a senior in high school. It means perhaps volunteering. But we thought, since there was a huge headline, breaking news, coming out of your office, that you had appointed somebody to oversee civic education, we thought it would be interesting to start the conversation <coughs> with you and see what, what you're doing and seeing if there are ways that we can help or maybe there are gaps that we can fill in, etc. So with that. I appreciate the opportunity for this conversation. And, uh, thank you so much for having me, um, Secretary of State Sarah Copeland, Kansas. Um, I am uh, bringing this idea forward uh, in part because I think a lot of the work that we've done under my predecessor, Jim Condos, to make voting accessible uh, for Vermonters has, uh, has gone a long way in terms of uh, increasing the number of people who participate in elections. Um, having been a state representative for 18 years, 18 years of you know watching uh, watching how people engage in the process and standing out on election day you hear a lot of you get into a lot of conversations with your neighbors about why they're voting um, and sometimes conversations about why they're not voting um, and uh, you know some of the some of the frustrations that people brought to our attention over the years uh, around I came here to vote and you know my clerk told me I wasn't registered and that I needed to have done that last week and I'm really angry you know we've dealt with some of those things with some of the reforms on same day voter registration um, and automatic voter registration and now I think I want to really tackle the next reason why uh, you might engage with someone and find that they don't vote and that and that is a whole suite of uh, reasons uh, that sort of range from, oh, my vote doesn't matter, or, you know, it. I don't even know who any of those people are, or uh, I have no idea what, you know, what all those offices are, or I hate politics because it just, uh, you know, because all they hear about politics is whatever the sensational headline was, or, or they assume that Vermont is just like Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. when in reality, you can have a really uh, regular conversation with your elected official 
once you know who they are, because you're probably going to see them in line at the grocery store or on the sidelines of a ball game, or no you matter know, what party, no matter what party, no party. and Absolutely. and you and and we have a very open and accessible government in Vermont, um, and so I think that this is the next phase of what we need to do to tackle um, the the voter apathy or the or the reasons why people don't participate. I'm gonna point out just a subset of the population though that really, that I think um, makes this work really, really important, and that is um, the young adult population. Uh, these are folks who, um, who have come through some of the uh, biggest and most tumultuous times in our lives. These are young people who, you know, whose first memory is 9-11, yeah. who, uh, who came through, you know, the what we called quaintly the Great Recession, and I think we just didn't even realize what was coming at us with the pandemic um, and with the war on terror. Uh, these are these are young people who don't have the opportunities that maybe uh, your generation or my generation had in terms of being able to expect home ownership, to be able to expect to graduate from college and relatively shortly be debt free and able to start uh, saving for a retirement future or uh, or starting a family. And so I think engaging with, with uh, the young adult population who have such a tremendous, um, well, the, the, the future of our country is in their hands, right? Um, if, we don't, if we don't train them and bring them up in the ways of participating in our democracy and in the ways of influencing the decisions that are made uh, by their government on their behalf, um, then I don't know where we go in the future when, when this generation of leaders is, is ready to uh, step aside. And so it's really important to me that we think about ways to, uh, to sort of unpack this problem and fix it here in Vermont. And I, and I say this on a number of different levels and different, about different issues. If there was a place in the union where we could come up with the answers to these challenges, it is in Vermont because we are small, we are uh, close-knit communities, we talk to we, each other even across uh, political divides. Uh, we have a lot of the sort of markers of, uh, of good civic participation already embedded in our way of being in small Vermont communities. Um, and we just need to add a little bit more substance to what people have for information so that they know how to participate, um, so that they know how to vet a candidate. I mean, if one of the, one of the offices that we often vote for um, that, that people just don't understand is the office of sheriff. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they think, oh, well, this is just, you know, this is just the police, right? So I'm just voting on a police officer. Well, that's not that's not really the role of the sheriff, um, and uh, and it has a, a much larger impact on your community than than you might think. But uh, so few people really know what what the role is about. Um, so let me talk just a little bit about uh, sort of what our plan is in the office, and then I'm happy to take questions, uh, hear suggestions. I'm glad that you. We're talking with the Board of Education. A lot of this, uh, this work around uh, civics education is gonna rely on uh, a collaboration between the agency and the board and, uh, and our education and civic engagement work. Um, so we are in the process of hiring a person for this position right now. Uh, we have at least 15 applicants um, and, and that number will probably increase uh, as I, I scanned the list this morning and, and didn't see a few names that I thought might be there, so they're probably still going to apply. Um, this would be a full-time position within the Secretary of State's office. This would be somebody who would uh, work closely with the executive team, the secretary and deputy secretary, uh, but also work along with our municipal assistance team and with our elections team. Um, the phase one of this project would be to create um, Vermont relevant civics curriculum that is standards based that can easily be brought in and plugged in by a, a Vermont school teacher and, uh, and you know, is, uh, is, is accessible for them to 
uh, to be able to check off those uh, standards that they need to teach to anyway. Um, in the lower grades, this would probably look like, um, you know, maybe seasonal units on, you know, town meeting day or, uh, or on election years, you know, a, a November unit around what's the sheriff, what, what's the state senator, what, yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, and, and I think it would also, you know, include, um, you know, lessons just in what does it mean to be in a democracy? What does it mean to make a decision as a group about something and a direction that we might go in? Um, and and I know that a lot of elementary school teachers already incorporate this into their lessons, but what, what can we do for our group as a whole that you wouldn't be able to do individually for yourself? And, and you know, start prompting those, that kind of um, contemplation by uh, young elementary students about what, you know, what's the point of living in a democracy? Well, the, the point is, is all of those things. Um, and then, of course, in when you get into the high school years, then you want it to start looking more like voter preparation. Like, how do you register to vote? Uh, what does a ballot look like? What is the experience of voting? Um, how do you participate in town meeting? Um, I'm learning a lot from what other states do, and there are other states who, um, who will actually uh, allow town clerks to uh, to use uh, registered voters, pre-registered voters. These are young people who, you know, will be 18 by the election, and so they can re register at, ahead of time and vote in that primary. But allowing them to serve um, as poll workers, so that they get the opportunity to see what it's like to be in a polling place and to assist. And if you recall some of the challenges that we had during the pandemic of figuring out how do we safely conduct elections when so many of our poll workers are your retired school teacher or your retired postmaster and people in that demographic who shouldn't be greeting folks face to face all day long during a, a pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, a great idea, uh, I think, would be to, to try to figure out ways to bring young people into that process and, and get them working um, in our elections. So the phase one is, is that curriculum. We will uh, set up a teacher advisory group. And so I went to the Association of Teachers of Social Studies last December um, and invited folks to, to just be aware that we're gonna set this advisory group up and we really wanna make sure that we um, have uh, the, the help and advice of folks who are in the classroom so that what we're creating is, uh, is easy for them to use. Um, and uh, and so with the help of that teacher advisory group, we'll, we'll set up this, uh, this set of civics curriculum for different grade levels. Uh, phase two of the role, uh, the project for the education and civic engagement coordinator is to, is to then adapt that for interaction with adults out in the communities. Um, because I want us to be out, you know, tabling at farmers markets and uh, and festivals, engaging with Vermonters where they are. Um, because over the years, as a as an elected representative, I would have conversations with people, you know, all over the state, and and you know, talking about, you know, are you planning to vote? Do you know how to how you plan to vote? You know, is there anything that you need? Um, and you know now that the general election is universal vote by mail, folks have uh, have a pretty clear idea of how easy and straightforward it is to vote in the general election. Um, but there are still people who are unsure of how to participate in the primary, uh, particularly because we have a three-party system, and folks forget that you know you, you're going to get three ballots. You can only fill out one. And I'm sorry if the person that you wanted to vote for isn't on this ballot that you. Are planning to fill out. That's you know that's part of partisan politics. The person you want to vote for, you know, maybe isn't in the party that you identify with. But um, I guess you you can write them in. Um, so phase two is to to talk with adults um, and and start interacting with adults on uh, civic participation. I haven't exactly figured out how to crack this nut, but I hear from so many local municipal leaders about how hard it is to get people to participate in their local government. And I think a lot of what we 
ought to be thinking about doing is really helping people feel ready and prepared to step up and, uh, and serve on that school board or that planning commission or the library board or, or whatever it might be. Um, because so many of these institutions in our small communities are just starving for, for people to, to come and be part of it. Board of civil authority. Yes. I mean, is there a requirement that poll workers be on the board? Um, so the town clerk can uh, can enlist people because the many towns need way more um, poll workers than they have members of the board of civil authority. So the town clerk will set up a system for training and appointing for, for that day. Um, so the final uh, the final thing that I want to <coughs> talk with you about that I'm hoping our <coughs> sorry I got a little tickle in my throat I'm supposed to have any water in here mm -hmm. <coughs> do you want to grow some water sure. we have chocolate and peanut that was <laughs> <laughs> chocolate always helps yeah. <laughs> it does it definitely um, does so now that people are going to get their general election ballot in the mail. Um, I would also like my office to begin creating a voter guide. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, great. Um, because when you get your ballot in the mail, it's all well and good that you have you know 45 days to fill out your ballot. But again, if you don't know what a sheriff does or a high bailiff, I mean, yeah. how 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 many of us really know what the high bailiff does? Um, if you don't know what the what the office is. How do you discern which of the candidates who is on your ballot is the one who's going to do the job the best? Mm -hmm. And so that voter guide, um, ideally, would be a, a you know a QR code associated with your ballot style that has your county level, your state representative level, your state senate level um, candidates, and uh, and a description of of what the office does. So that you can spend that time researching. Maybe the candidate has a website. Maybe they have a social media presence. Um, we will require them to put a mailing address and a, and a phone number um, so that you could reach out to them and, and ask them the question that's important to you in your high bailiff. Yeah. I don't know if it's, you know, it's interesting. I, I just think of people, maybe my parents age-ish. I'm not sure if the QR code it's, you know, yes, 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 but I know yeah. some people also who are just yeah. amazing, and, and it's people my age, you know, who aren't very, you know, so it, it's not an age thing, but so there is there a way option. to get yes, something? Yes, there will be an option to order okay. a paper right. copy of right. it, um, and, and I think that we, we're going to try to make this as accessible as possible. It needs to be translated into other languages when we've got folks whose native language maybe isn't English, um, but, but making this, uh, available and accessible to voters um, when they get their ballot is really the key so that you can spend some time in your weeks. So phenomenal idea. Saw it while I was on active duty in California. California's voter's guide is it's very, very helpful. And if you want to see a copy, I've got a copy. Do you? I do. I, yeah. I drag it around to see everywhere. A copy. Yeah. Phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but, but what's the mechanism for making that a reality? I mean, what, what do you need either from the legislature or, I mean, ha, good ideas, but you know, how does it become yeah. formal? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, first, uh, the first step in that is, is tied to the, um, the new election management system that we're going out for to bid for right now. Um, because what we want to do is we want to, when you register to be a candidate, have have the majority of the information that's going to go into the voter guide be information that you right. that you provide as a candidate when when you uh, get yourself on the ballot. Um, once it's once it's then in the system, then it it's you know it's a little bit of back end work on the software to, to get it out on a on an outward facing website and then print it into. But is it is it a goal? Is it a personal goal or is it a state goal to do this by 2024, 2026? It is my goal to do this for the general election in 24. Okay. And if you know, in an ideal world, we would um, we would build this module in the software such that we could then 
hand the module off to your municipal uh, officials so that when you have a, a municipal election, they could use it as well to create a voter guide. Um, but that is sort of, um, you know, a, a, an out, out years vision that, um, that I'm hoping can be made into a reality because so many town clerks say, gosh, during election time, I get so many calls yeah. and they yeah. want me to say, well, no. they want me to say who's so-and-so and, -so and yeah. you know, yeah. you know, and, yeah. the, and you know, it's, yeah. who should I vote? It's yeah. great, but yeah. 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 it's very uncomfortable yeah. for the yeah. clerks yeah. to be asked that yeah. question. Yeah. And, um, and at least if they have the ability to point folks to a listing of, of at least what the candidates say about themselves. And then obviously there's a little discerning that you have to do because you have to read between the lines. Uh, reverting back to your original uh, conversation, which was about civic literacy, I believe first in the school, secondly, potentially <coughs> at goal level you know, engagements and such, but do you have, a, have you gotten to maturity yet where you have kind of like a scope or a scale of what you want to do and, and how it would potentially fit into the uh, current school curriculum? Is it that true? Not yet, and, and this is where it, it becomes helpful to have this back and forth conversation because I know that the conversation around requiring civics education has come up in this building um, many times in recent years, and what does that curriculum look like? Um, and, uh, and, and there have been legitimate reasons why that requirement hasn't moved into law. Um, and so given that the Secretary of State doesn't have influence on uh, education policy, my my thought is to make it a carrot. Let's make it as easy to use as possible. Let's make it Vermont uh, relevant and accessible and exciting and provide it. And you know, if you build it, maybe they will come. Um, may I re make a recommendation? Absolutely. So we've, we've had a couple conversations in here about um, financial literacy. Mm -hmm. Maybe just as a recommendation, partner with the treasurer and say, "Hey, we've got this." It's almost as if you were standing just outside of earshot of the conversation uh, I had with uh, Treasurer okay. Pichak. Yes, I, I I pitched to him that you know if we're working on uh, on, on work to get critical uh, lessons out into schools, that maybe his office could uh, collaborate with us because I know that there's a lot of work that they would like to do in terms of improving uh, financial literacy. It's a great idea, and he's going to be here tomorrow and raise it with him. But I was also thinking, you know, the attorney general law class. I mean, there it, there's something that you've started here that's that's really really intriguing. Senator Williams and then Senator okay, Senator Blewett. Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, when I get called on, I like freeze. <laughs> I have this moment of total. <laughs> and you're, you're on camera, yeah. by the way. I know. Oh my god. I know I had a question. Um, no, I think what I was going to say was there is a bill that will be coming to us at some point about civics education. And my question for you was, is that helpful or is that to what you're doing or is that kind of uh, in conflict with what you're doing? And then I had a second question, too. Well, I, I make... would hope that it would be in alignment with what we're okay. trying to do, because what 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 I want us to do, first and foremost, is reach out to the education community and find out what they would need in order to use what we're creating. I don't want to create something that's going to sit in a box over at 128 and, and never be looked at again. Okay. So maybe we and should so all work together when that bill mm -hmm. comes around yeah. and would be happy to come look at it. And my other question was just around uh, professional development for teachers because I know there are a lot of teachers, um, just adults, let's face it, who we've all sort of taken our democracy for granted for a long time. And yes. I just, I hope that there's going to be some structured professional develop for fo professional development for folks who will be stepping into that arena. I would love for us to be able to offer professional development credits as we, as we roll this curriculum out to teachers. Do you know what percentage of eligible voters vote in the state? Well, it's uh, it's generally between forty and sixty, depending on the election. Okay. Um, and you know the the high watermark elections, as you can imagine, tend to coincide with the presidential yeah. years. And um, and you know a lot of what motivates people to get out and vote is you know the excitement of somebody who is at the top of that ticket. 
Um, and you know, I think it's important for folks to also understand that sometimes the the places on the ballot that might be most impactful for their lives are those places further down on the ballot or on the back of the ballot where it's you know, your local or your, your state rep and state senator level mm -hmm. officials. You know, even school board and city council. I mean, I just sometimes I find like that's really the most direct, has almost like the most direct effect mm -hmm. on my day to day living. Right. It's what right. happens on the Burlington City Council. And yeah, I mean, it's your property tax bill. Is, yeah. is those are those are the people who are making the decisions that impact one of one of your yeah. most significant bills. So we did talk to Sue Sigalowski about recruiting. Can they start a little bit more of a campaign to recruit people to run for school board? Because that at least, I mean, at least in my area, that's where people mm -hmm. you're you're always looking for folks. Um, and. They have a brochure, but we suggested, you know, maybe they could, you know, get something going, you know, on Facebook or social media or whatever the kids are watching today, TikTok. TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I believe it's TikTok. So you gotta get Taylor <laughs> Swift to write a song yeah, right, about school right, boards. Right. right. <laughs> um, How cool they are. You know, I do have this sort of, I don't know, the country is so big. And we all know our elected officials statewide, you know, our folks that go to DC. Here in California, or New York, I mean, it's neighborhood, the neighborhood. Right. It, it really is the folks that you know that I think you're going to perhaps get out and try to support. You know. But but I also have this. I don't know. I'd be curious to know if if the more rural states, smaller populated states, if our percentage of voter turnout is higher than larger states. You know, I. I I don't know. I mean, when the founders, you know, we've got 50 of these, should we have a hundred? I mean, it's just so big where, you you know, it's uh, almost more states uh, and kind of more representation because you know the people, you really know who those, those folks are. Yeah. I don't have a bill that does that. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm. yeah it's, I think the voter guide is great. Um, yeah. Um, professional development credits, all sorts of great stuff here. Any other questions for uh, Secretary of State? Hey, you registered to vote? Uh, not yet. Not yet. No, not yet. Me too. Okay. Right. Do you know how to? Do I do. Have, do you have yes. your driver's license? I do. And so <laughs> when you when you applied for your driver's license, did you um, did you opt out of being automatically registered to vote? Oh, actually, no, I didn't. So, so you might check with your temp clerk right. because you might find yourself on the voter rolls. I you... just did that too. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Can do that. Great. So, I would also, as we continue the conversation, Act 77, Flexible Pathways. You were in the legislature when that was passed. That's why Hayden's here from Spalding High School as a senior. It's, you know, are there ways that we can, you, you and AOE can work together? Is, would, could you have a database in some ways uh, that? would give students a, a resource and a place to go to find jobs in their communities or internships or paid experiences related to Act 77, but they also might make a few bucks in the summer, that kind of thing. Right. Um, so okay. I know everybody's going to be throwing different ideas out, but I think it's just the, the voter guide itself and the fact they're doing this is yes. great. Well, when we go into phase two, which yep. is getting out there in communities, we will be looking for a whole whole host of interns to help us um, get out and, and uh, table at the local farmers market. Great. Anything else? Thanks a million. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, really um, please it. do be in touch, especially, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, be in touch when uh, when you continue the conversation around civics. Yeah. There's a fellow out there, Matt Henshin. Met him. I'll try to get you his contact information. Mm -hmm. He came into this committee last year and testified. A few other teachers did as well. They were yeah. very impressive in terms of what they were yes. teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you, and, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Good. and some of those folks, I'm hoping, will uh, join our advisory group to uh, Great. to help inform our curriculum development. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice to see yeah, you all. Same. You too. Wonderful to be in, in the, the corner room. This is a beautiful yeah. space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the water. All right. Thank you. How did I do? What's my grade? Hey, hey listen. It's a solid. solid. It's a solid. Yeah. It's a solid. <laughs>
As was Jennifer uh, Sanders saying that she's watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to lose that. <laughs> Thanks for the chocolate. You guys get an A as well. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for the water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, committee. Uh, uh, three, 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 three. All right, so we've got about five minutes before our next, our final witness. So let's take a quick stretch and we'll wrap it up. Uh, thanks. Hey, welcome back to Senate Education. We're closing the day uh, with Rebecca Wasserman, Legislative Counsel, who wrote Act 72, uh, School Facilities Bill. When did we pass that? In 21. So it was my. First year, okay, so two years ago. And so what, we have four new senators uh, to this work, and so we thought we would just have an opportunity to hear an overview and take some, you take some questions in the next 15 minutes or so. I can do that. Perfect, uh, thank you. <laughs> Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Also, um, this bill, as you mentioned, um, is relating to the needs of uh, school facilities in the state. And there's some background to it with the um, moratorium on the state aid for school construction program. So I can go through the bill and I, I can give you a quick overview of that now or I can just go through the bill and sort of highlight where there's like a, a reference to that and why decisions were made in this bill. I don't know what would there's be. an overview of the bill, what okay. it does, okay. uh, what work we should be expecting back and what. Okay as it relates to our work. Great. So um, this bill start, starts off with section one, which is some um, findings. And I don't know if we have a copy of the bill in front of us. We do. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. So I will wait for I don't see it. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not seeing it. I can also pull it up on Zoom and I have a link if that. I can just share the screen, so okay. Great, let's do that and uh, we can get some copies later. You guys don't mind the sound of shuffling papers, do you? Not yet. Great, thank okay. you. Okay. So, um, very quickly, the, the findings section is um, sort of acknowledging that the state aid for school construction program, um, there was a moratorium placed on that. School construction uh, used to be paid for through general obligation bonds out of the capital bill. And uh, the, the legislature made a decision in 2007 to pause that program and sort of continue to that moratorium, that suspension until um, all the money that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the debt that was incurred was paid back um, until 2016. And so um, the findings are sort of acknowledging that that moratorium was put into place. Um, however, um, there's a, a need in the state um, in subsection B that between 2008 and 2019, school districts in Vermont issued approximately uh, $211 million in bonds for school construction projects. And as of... Let's go ahead. Just curious, any, any data on how that $211 million compares to the normal flow of uh, school construction um, projects uh, preceding? I can get JFO to give you that information. I, I remember at the time this was done that they, that they had they worked, I think, with the Municipal Bond Bank had sort of a chart that they put together, so I can, okay. I think it has, Good the answer is that it has grown, but I don't know by how much. Okay. Um, but I will, I will get you that information. Um, and then this bill at the time in 2020, there was an estimated $445 million in planned bonding, um, but I know that that number is updated since then. Um, <clears throat> and then there are some more findings about the backlog in the state school construction projects, um, and then some intent about um, developing a plan to address the needs and conditions of the state school buildings. Um, and also, um, subsection E of the bill, there was a purpose of um, 
the, the funding appropriated in the act was done through the ESSER funds that came, the allocations that came to the state um, from the federal government, um, to, and that was used to improve the conditions for health and safety of students and staff and to address other eligible facility needs and to um, the backlog of, uh, of school facility needs in an efficient and equitable manner. So that was sort of the purpose behind the bill. Um, section two of the bill, um, subsection A was directing the Secretary of Education to work with um, the Superintendents Association and the Chair of the State Board and the Commissioner of EGS to update the school construction facility standards by January 15th of uh, this year. Um, I, I don't actually have any a status update on whether that has been completed, but I can look into that. Um, and so keeping in mind that the program that was in place, what well, has not been used since 2007, the, there, was a, there were some sort of standards and rules that applied in that program that were very outdated. So section two is trying to sort of um, get new facility standards for all schools and subsection B was directing the State Board of Education to update and adopt a new rule on um, the capital outlay financing formula that that was used under the old school construction program by January 15th of this year as well do we have that uh, do we can we see a copy of that is that available of the updated rule. Right. I think I you want to introduce it. yourself and yeah. just mention refer. Sure, Jill Briggs Campbell Agency of Education. I was just in the building presenting on this. Okay. <laughs> okay. So Great. you're going to pop over. Um, so happy to come in and give you a more thorough presentation. But uh, the capital outlay um, financing formula is being delayed because we're conducting the facilities assessment, which I think we'll be talking about in just a moment. Uh, and that's going to inform that work. Uh, and the district facility standards that were referenced just a moment ago, those are uh, essentially in alignment with those district quality standards that Secretary French was presenting to you all on last week. So that work is essentially overlapping. That's what we heard about last Thursday with the superintendents. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But they're all looking to upgrade their facility. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then finally in section two, there was some money appropriated um, to uh, the, the Agency of Education for this work um, to provide technical assistance to the state board. And that was $100,000 that could be used out of the, um, the full amount of the ESSER funding appropriated in the bill. Um, section three of the bill uh, deals with um, an inventory and conditions assessment of all the uh, schools in the state. So the Secretary of Education um, was directed to work with EGS to issue an RFP, um, and that was uh, required by September 1st of 2021. And that would be for a school facilities inventory and conditions assessment to ascertain the extent of need for um, additional support to school districts as a result of COVID-19 and to inform AOB of the statewide school facilities needs and costs. Um, uh, noting the October 1 completion, is that been extended or is that completed? The inventory is complete okay. and the assessment work uh, was extended to 2023, October 2023. That work is underway and will be completed. So, so the Sorry, the, the deadline was extended last session right. in, I want to say the miscellaneous ed bill, but I'm not sure. Okay. When you say assessment, that's uh, costing of uh, each project? Uh, so. Yeah. And if you look in the, the language of 72, it's a really detailed, comprehensive facilities assessment, including a two-year energy audit as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. so this um, section basically requires the project to be done in two phases, the inventory and then the assessment. And the assessment phase um, was looking at evaluating and collecting information to um, develop like a ranking system to prioritize schools with the highest needs for school construction. And, and um, as was mentioned, there's sort of a list of, of how that um, prioritization was done in the bill. 
Um, there was an appropriation of 2.5 million in the ESSER funds um, for this work of the inventory and the assessment. And then AOE was also asked to create a database to enter all the information from the assessment um, to um, like have it all in one place. Uh, I think historically this information just came in in not all together, and so it was hard to track what all this, the needs were across the state. Um, and then there was a report due last year on the, the findings of the inventory and a progress update on the assessment. Um, as you heard, the assessment has been, uh, the, the report has been pushed back. Um, section four of the bill, um, so it's on page six, asks the Secretary of Education by January 15th to submit a report to the General Assembly and on funding for school construction projects. So that is looking at the challenges and opportunities to the state of funding school construction projects, um, recommendations for a funding source for the projects that are linked to that inventory um, needs and conditions of all Vermont schools, and an analysis of how um, funding is done in other states for school construction projects. And then section five of the bill on page seven, and happy, I'm going too fast, let me know. <laughs> um, there, uh, there are some requirements in this bill on, uh, sort of on school districts. So section five is um, ask the Secretary of Education to come up with um, some training and certification guidelines for each person designated responsible for facilities management at a school district or supervisory union. Um, and that also requires the superintendent of each school district um, or supervisory union to designate a person responsible for facilities man management and, and that person has to receive that AOE certification and training. So, thank you. Um, that doesn't already exist. Um, there was okay. not a requirement in statute. Some, I think, some districts had a, a, such a person, but I don't. I don't think statewide that was the case. Thank you. Uh, page eight of the bill requires a school district. Um, to develop and maintain a five-year capital operations and improvement plan for the school district and supervisory union, and, and there's a requirement that that is updated annually. Um, and the Secretary of Education was directed in subsection B to come up with a, a form to be used by all schools to, to do that plan. Um, what, what's the date on that? When do they need to have that five-year Capital operation. Uh, I that section was effective on passage of the bill, so um, I think it somewhat relies on the Secretary of Education having the form developed, which I actually don't know if that's been done. You want to edit it yeah, here? so we would expect that the facilities assessment work, which would result in a comprehensive assessment report um, that also goes into a database that's called Asset Calc that actually puts some dollar amounts on, on those needs. That work would come before we would expect any district to develop a five-year capital plan. So there is a, a logical, it feels like these are all disparate elements, but there's actually a really logical step-by-step -step process to this particular bill. So this assessment work is sort of the critical pivot point for a lot of the things that are following down the yeah. How, how are the districts in compliance? Are they doing? In terms of the, the response to the assessment and inventory, the, so the inventory was a self reported inventory last year, and uh, all but six schools in the entire state responded. So that's extraordinary, frankly. I uh, wish I could get that kind of response on everything. And with the assessment, the, the work is underway, the, you know, the boots are on the ground right now. And that's, you know, it's on the contractor to ensure that every public school building is assessed. So we expect 100% on that. Certainly. Uh, curiosity, the five-year capital operations plan. Uh, it, it, in my mind, it would seem that there's actually like two plans. One plan, they, are, they have projected, they have current budgets, they have projected budgets. 
they, you know, they're not anticipating, you know, big investment. They just have to continue. I assume that would be one one set of funds or one plan, and then secondary would be the larger, uh, you know, wish list of okay, we really got to address this within the next five year period or what have you. Is that exactly? I mean, we would want ideally every district to have maintenance and operation, right? Yeah. So that's been one of the the big issues that we run into is the deferred maintenance costs. If you defer your maintenance long enough, it becomes construction. Uh, so having that kind of plan for ongoing maintenance and operations and then your big investment wish list. Some districts do this already. Like I want to be really clear, there, there's some districts, you know, Montpelier Roxbury has a five year plan, uh, but it is inconsistent and not all districts have it. So it's creating a standard that they would have those plans. And you're exactly right. There's the big projects that need to be bonded or state, potential state funding, and then there's your ongoing maintenance. So where is all this money going to come from? Is it going to be bonds? It's an excellent question. That's that so tomorrow is a question hearing, before you all. <laughs> so we are hearing from Treasurer uh, Pichak tomorrow. Yeah. Some of his ideas, and then we're also meeting with, who are we meeting with tomorrow from the feds? Who's, who we have agreements from? <clears throat> Rebecca Ellis, and I invited the other person. OK, and you haven't heard that? OK. And Treasurer Pichak is also in conversation with Secretary French. OK. So that we're working collaboratively on yeah. the mm -hmm. construction funding. Going to be a lot. Senator Blewett, please tell us you have a chuckle. <laughs> um, no, I just, uh, this is just a great opportunity to have a, like, a little mini conversation, which was before that we had to bond for 165 million. We had to bond for 39 million for def because we had so much deferred maintenance on our schools around Burlington. We have some really This is old, before the PCB thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Before the high school. Totally yeah. separate from the high school. Because we have some really old buildings. And um, so those have all fallen on, on the Burlington taxpayers, just FYI. But um, I do think it was a really great point the other day at our presentation that those bond, the bonding that you do in a municipality ends up getting tacked on to your per pupil number, right. which is really a, creates a strange conflict in your in your district when it comes time to voting on a school budget. So mm -hmm. that's one of the things that we'll have to talk Where's about. Where's property tax? Yeah, yeah, and that just that number just really scares people. Mm -hmm. and, but it is all part of that pot. That's why I asked the question. No, I know, and I think it's a good one, and I hope yeah. we get to dig into it more because it's important. And the willingness of, you know, or the ability and willingness for some communities to pass those bond measures and others to not is why we have the inequities across our mm -hmm. state-wide facilities. Sure. Yeah. Um, so Page eight, section seven is creating some positions to do all this work. Um, so there is uh, one uh, limited service position that was funded out of ESSER funds um, through January 15th of 2023. Um, actually, I don't know if that was extended in another, I'll have to check on that. Um, Section eight, uh, amend, um, bottom of page eight, amended um, the threshold that requires schools to go out to bid for school construction projects from 15,000 to 40,000. Section nine um, of the bill authorized the Secretary of Education to hire a consultant um, using ESSER funds um, until September 30th of 2023 to uh, essentially help schools use the money that they received from from the federal ESSER allocation to improve the health and sa safety of a district school facilities. Um, so the consultant's duties um, are things like project coordination and acting as a liaison between the school and the agency. And um, there was an allocation uh, for this consultant position. Section uh, 10 of the bill on page 11 <clears throat> has the Agency of Education coming back 
uh, to this committee um, and, and the House Education Committee and then the Institutions Committees in the House and Senate. Um, after consulting with BGS uh, to submit a report on how the state's energy management program can be used to support schools um, making energy efficiency and uh, conservation measure uh, Im implement, implement needed energy efficiency and conservation measures at schools. Um, and those, that's something that I'm not sure can be done at this point because it um, was supposed to be uh, measures identified in the assessment, which is not there yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll have this report to you, but schools are not eligible for those funds. So uh, there was discussion about making them eligible in the last session, but it did not move forward. Was there, is there a reason why they're not eligible? I mean, they're specifically made ineligible in statute. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a statutory <laughs> okay. yeah. issue. It's an intent. This is coming back to me now. So. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Are you like You wrote this. <laughs> oh, she I, hasn't I, had I, to touch it in two years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so on page 11, Section 11, um, there, there was established a renewable ener energy an efficiency heating system grant program to award grants to schools for renewable and efficient heating systems. Um, this program was included in this bill. Uh, it, it was something that was going to be administered by Efficiency Vermont, so I don't know the status of it, but it was included in the bill without an appropriation, so I don't know if anything happened. So that one was not funded. Um, but a parallel program using ARPA SFRF funds, which is called the High Poverty um, Heating Program, is run through the Department of Public Service under uh, Andrew Perchler and Chris Fine. That's right. Yeah. And then Section 12 of the bill um, asks each public school and approved independent school to perform uh, radon testing. Uh, in the school, if, they, if that facility had not had a test completed in five years or more, um, but if the school was engaging in implementing an indoor air quality improvement project prior to J June 30th, 2023, then they had to, um, their sort of date to do this radon measurement was pushed to June 30th, 2024. And then the schools were asked to make the results of that um, testing available to each employee and student at the school. Um, and then the effective date, section 30, was that the bill is effective on passage. <clears throat> Any questions or final comments for Ms. Wasserman? Yeah, I don't know, because I don't know the ropes, but how yeah. can you how can you pass a bill with mandates without appropriating money to do it. Well, this, uh, there was an appropriation for, for the bill itself. Oh, yes, yeah. it's just that particular grant I'm program. About that yeah, section. so there was a subsection that said that during the 2022 legislative session, mm -hmm. so last year, the General Assembly would determine a source of funding for the program. So it pushed it to the second year of the biennium for them to figure out how to fund it. And that did not happen. Did not happen. <laughs> and and just one last point on um, the radon testing in I think again it was the miscellaneous ed bill that deadline was pushed out to June of 2025 to better align it with the PCD requirements. Um, so there is that been extended. Hey, would you print us all a copy of the bill? They just leave it for us for tomorrow. So you Yeah, no, it's, it's it's a lot, and I think we'll have a copy in front of us to take a look at everything. Have you back in for additional questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Committee, tomorrow we will, as you know, hear from some at least uh, Senator Welch's office on this issue, and the and the state treasurer's office. Um, and then we are also going to pick up both your hearing uh, from a number of witnesses on the school safety issue and the Teach in Vermont campaign.